In the mid-1980s, a highly sophisticated serial killer was on the loose. And I've come back tonight on a very special mission, an international manhunt for the so-called Green River Killer. Not just America's most wanted, but perhaps the most dangerous single killer in the entire world. If anyone out there knows of anyone that is doing those kinds of things, we need your help tonight, so please call in. It was murder after murder, but the authorities would fail at almost every turn. This is the twisted tale of Gary Ridgway, the Green River Killer who killed 71 women. The soiled bedsheets. Gary Ridgway's childhood was full of constant humiliation. When a boy reaches a certain age, there is nothing more humiliating than wetting the bed. It is something only a young baby would do, and it is a mark of shame for a child. Even at toddler age, as a teenager, Gary Ridgway was still accidentally urinating on his bedsheets, much to the frustration and annoyance of his mother. However, Gary Ridgway's mother did not help things either. She would bathe him immediately afterward. Despite being a teenager at the time, she would embarrass and belittle him in front of the whole family about his bedwetting. But beyond the verbal and emotional abuse, things got physical too. In fact, she did something, under the guise of being a loving mother, that was deeply despicable. She started washing her son's genitals, something which Gary did not fully know was unusual, but she knew that this was a form of abuse. When studying Ridgway in adulthood, the neurologist Jonathan Pincus said, don't believe that that is the only thing that happened that was untoward. This spiraled into a circular behavior. Bedwetting is often a response to trauma, and Gary's mother's response to his bed wetting was traumatic. Gary developed what's known as an edible complex, where a boy is physically attracted to his own mother. His mind was awash with confusion, frustration, and violent thoughts. Over time, Ridgway fantasized about killing his own mother, but never acted upon this urge. Instead, he stabbed a young boy, but did not kill him. Ridgway later said that he just wanted to see what stabbing was like. Ridgway left him in the woods and walked away laughing and said, I always wondered what it would be like to kill an admirable killer. Toward his latter teens and early adulthood, Ridgway was a man admired. During the Vietnam War, many men his age were terrified of being drafted onto the battlefield. Ridgway was quite the opposite and signed himself up. Before enlisting to fight for his country, he married his girlfriend, Claudia Barrows. In the space of half a decade, this teenage bedwetter was on his way to becoming an American hero. But when you scratch beneath the surface, something else was going on. Whether Claudia knew it or not, Gary had an unquenchable sex drive. And during his military service, he spent a lot of time with sex workers. While a man married man hiring sex workers is incredibly sleazy, his immoral behavior would soon be turned up by a few notches. He contracted gonorrhea and decided that this was not going to get in the way of his extracurricular activities. Despite having a harmful STD, he continued hiring sex workers and did not even bother wearing protection. It's not the worst of Ridgway's crimes, but it demonstrates the disregard he has for anyone else, particularly women. All that mattered was satisfying his urges. When Ridgway arrived home from Nam, he was expecting a hero's welcome. He married his childhood sweetheart, served in the military, and could now maybe start a family. He had even gotten a steady job painting trucks at the Kenworth Truck Factory. What Gary didn't realize is that while he was away in Vietnam, Claudia was having her own fun too. She started dating another man, and her marriage with Gary ended. By 1972, they were divorced, and she was no longer involved with Gary Ridgway. Looking back on what happened afterward, she might consider that moment a lucky escape. A new lady. Ridgway moved on incredibly quickly. By 1973, he had a new lady in his life, Marsha Winslow. He got married that year and had a son two years later named Matthew. In Gary's neighborhood, many residents opened the door to find Gary holding a Bible and hoping to spread the news about the good Lord. He would visit sermons and sometimes burst into tears when Bible verses were read aloud. He became incredibly religious, but didn't always practice what he preached. His insatiable sex drive lingered on, and he regularly demanded sex of Marsha, and sometimes even requested to have relations outside, but that simply wasn't enough, and he continued to hire sex workers. The Bible-thumping preacher roaming around their neighborhood was arguably the biggest sinner of them all. He often embraced his own hypocrisy. He complained about the presence of sex workers near his neighborhood, but part of the reason why they were in his neighborhood is because of the never-ending business Ridgway brought to them. Despite this secret life, he took being a father very seriously. When looking back on his childhood, Matthew was asked whether Gary attended any school functions. His response was, I don't think I ever remember him not being there. Marsha was overweight when they met, but towards the late 19th 70s, she'd had a gastric bypass surgery. This operation left Marsha with a new trim figure, and for someone as lustful as Gary, you would think that this would be a dream come true. However, Gary soon noticed the wandering stares from other men. Whether he imagined it or not, other men were now looking at his wife, and he was incredibly jealous and possessive. This caused more fights, but within their relationship, there was an even bigger elephant in the room. Gary's mother was still very much in the picture, and even though Gary was a full-grown adult, she was still incredibly domineering. She made decisions on their spending, and she even decided what clothes Gary 
Gary war. Whenever Marsha was in an argument with Gary's mother, Gary would never stick up for her. The fights between Marsha and Gary continued to escalate until Gary soon had Marsha in a chokehold that urged to kill those dark fantasies at the back of his mind, still raging on. But he did not kill Marsha. Marsha was now out of his life, but thankfully still alive. She divorced him, and Gary had custody of his son on weekends. Marsha, it was a lucky escape. Someone is out there. On July 15th, 1982, two local boys experienced a day that changed their lives forever. They discovered that floating across the Meeker Street Bridge in the Greenway River was a woman's body. A closer inspection found that the woman was strangled through the use of her own clothes. Her name was Wendy Lee Cofield, and she was only 16 years old. Wendy had been missing since July 8th and was a runaway foster care girl who was now working in the sex trade. This person had no relatives looking for her, so she would have remained at this point had she not been found. The marks on her body suggested that this was not suicide, and that somebody other than her ended her life. On July 17th, Giselle Ann Lavorne went missing. On the 25th, Deborah Lynn Bonner disappeared. In August, Marsha Chapman, Opal Charmaine, and Terry Renee Milligan all vanished off the face of the earth. Eventually, they were found in or near the Green River. By August of 1982, police believed that a serial killer was out there. Along Route 99 in South King County, Washington, sex workers were going missing and being killed almost on a weekly basis. The question on everyone's mind was, who? An unlikely assistant. Detective Dave Reichert was on the initial investigation, and by the time one body was found, another soon cropped up afterward near the Green River. He was soon dubbed the Green River Killer. For the police involved, this was no ordinary case. The police wanted to get inside the mind of a serial killer, a serial killer who specifically preyed upon vulnerable women. The detectives were offered a letter of help on this very issue by a man named Ted Bundy. Reichert told Fox News, We were pretty surprised that Ted Bundy would write to the task force. He made it very clear what his purpose was in his letter. What he wanted to do, according to his description, was to get us into the mind of a serial killer. While Bundy was a master of manipulation, Reichert saw through his attempt to help the police force, but he knew, just by the way the letter was written and the words he used, that he was just injecting himself into the situation, trying to find out as much as he could about the case. Bundy was fascinated by the Green River Killer. He killed far more women than Bundy and was taking away his spotlight as one of America's most notorious killers. There was a killer out there so despicable that he was making Ted Bundy jealous, and he was on the loose on their radar. A year into the string of killings was an important lead. In 1983, an 18-year-old sex worker named Marie Malvar disappeared, and she was last seen getting into a pickup truck on the Pacific Highway South. Her boyfriend and pimp spotted the same truck in front of Gary Ridgway's home. Gary was questioned and pleaded his innocence. He admitted that he had been arrested before for soliciting sex workers, and even admitted that he may have solicited some of the killer's victims. To get to the bottom of whether Gary was telling the truth or not, he was given a polygraph test. Ridgway took the test and was found to be telling the truth. According to this test, Ridgway had nothing to do with this crime. Although Ridgway had just gotten off the hook, it didn't take him long to grab the attention of the police once again. A year later, another sex worker reported a man who had paid for sex but tried to strangle her afterward. Inside this man's car was an employee identification card from Kenworth Truck Factory. The detectives questioned Ridgway once again. Ridgway claimed that he choked this woman in self-defense and he did this after she had bitten him. The woman did not press charges against Ridgway. Sex workers in this area were now risking their lives because their profession is illegal, they need to conduct their jobs under the cloak of darkness too. The secretive nature of the business fit right into the Green River killer's hands. But in 1985, the volume of murders suddenly slowed down, and coincidentally, Gary Ridgway had found the new love of his life, a true gentleman. In 1985, Judith Mawson was at a Parents Without Partners evening and was introduced to a nice, charming man who liked country music and was an old-school gentleman. I sat across from Gary and then he asked me to dance. Went out to dinner with him, I thought he was quite the gentleman. While they were dating, Gary invited Judith back to his home. When she reached Gary's home, she realized that there were no carpets. He told her his carpet was destroyed by kids and removed, and that his ex-girlfriend had taken her bed back. In 1987, police released a search warrant against Ridgway. This allowed police to search both his home and place of work. Whatever Ridgway was hiding, the police would soon find out. Police searched and searched, but could not find anything which linked Ridgway with these victims. The DNA sample they took could also not be linked with the victims either. As far as their searches, polygraph tests, and DNA samples, could tell them Gary Ridgway was a strange man, but not the Green River Killer. But just for safekeeping, the police kept hold of samples of Ridgway's hair and saliva. By 1988, Ridgway was in the clear and now in a loving relationship. He got married for the third time. He made me feel like a newlywed every day. The Wonders of Technology 
November 30th, 2001, was just another day at work for Gary at Kenworth Truck Factory. He was busy painting trucks, as he had been doing for the past 30 years, and looked forward to going home to see his loving wife. Despite their absence for 20 years, the police wanted to speak with Gary once again. By the new millennium, DNA testing had improved. It improved to such an extent that they began looking into different crimes. Dave Reichert was now King County Sheriff, but the mystery of the Green River Killer still cast a dark shadow across the entire community. With this new and improved technology, the department decided to review Gary Ridgway's DNA once again, and lo and behold, it was a match. His DNA was linked to the murder of four women. These women were Opal Mills, Cynthia Hines, Carol Ann Christensen, and one of his earliest victims, Marsha Chapman. Reichert told the Washington Post, this has got to be one of the most exciting days of my entire career. This is not only an exciting day for the people who work the case, but I know the community has got to be as excited about this as we are. Ridgway initially proclaimed his own innocence, but the scientific evidence which linked Ridgway to one of the victims was undeniable. After 20 years of searching, the police finally had their man. Ridgway was on trial for four murders, all of which had the same patterns as the Green River Killer. Judith Mawson's biggest flaw was being a loving wife. Gary kept telling Judith that he was innocent, that it was a case of mistaken identity, and because he was such a model husband and made her feel like a newlywed every day, she believed him. But Gary knew that lurking over his head was the prospect of the death penalty, and that he could be killed for his actions. Michelle Shaw was Ridgway's lawyer. She told Gary that if he confessed to these crimes, he would not face the death penalty. It would literally save his life. The more he cooperated with the authorities, the brighter his future would be. Confession. In Seattle today, a man called the Green River Killer has finally confessed to murdering 48 women and girls, making him the most prolific serial killer in American history. In 2003, Gary accepted a plea deal. He was given 48 consecutive life sentences, but still had the possibility of parole. He would agree to any further murders that they could substantiate with evidence. Ridgway's end of the deal was that he would provide the police with information to help find the bodies. By then, Ridgway was the most prolific serial killer in US history. His story was one which shook the world. Ridgway confessed to his crimes and told the authorities that he simply wanted to kill as many sex workers as possible. He told police that he targeted sex workers because he hated them, and there was a smaller chance that they would be reported missing. His tactic was as follows. He picked up a sex worker and brought her back to his home. While inside these four walls, these women were murdered. He then drove them out and dumped them in the Green River. To cover his tracks, Ridgway sometimes threw pieces of gum and cigarette butts from other people at the scene of the crime. When Gary was with Judith and sharing custody with Matthew, things got a lot more complicated. Sometimes, after dropping his son off at school, he visited the scenes of his multiple crimes along the Green River. To lull these women into a false sense of security, Ridgway showed them pictures of his son. In your, every, in your vehicle? Yeah, so every time I opened up my wallet, there would be a picture of my son on one side, uh, you know, behind my ID. There's my ID. I hide my name, mm -hmm. flip it over, and there's my ID. And uh, I sent a picture on the back side, and they'd see that, and that would uh, lower any big defenses. He also told investigators, I look like an ordinary person. Here's a guy, he's not really muscle bound. He's not, uh, look like a fighter. Just an ordinary John, and that was their downfall. My appearance was different from what I really was. Till deaths do us part. Judith believed him before the confessions. She never watched the news, so she did not know who the Green River Killer was, but she soon found out that this was her husband. With Gary now confessing to these murders, she filed for divorce. The 17 years of marriage were a complete and utter lie, and she feels like she should have read all the warning signs. All of the doubts in her mind she ignored came tunneling through. When she arrived at the home on that first night, she should have known why there were no carpets. They were covered in blood and needed to be disposed of. When he worked late or had to stay overnight, he was killing someone. He sometimes sometimes left for work early to make overtime pay, but was only killing more women. The reality was that Gary was taking any money held by his victims before dumping them. That was the overtime pay. Everything she knew about Gary was fake. She was another woman whose life was ruined by the actions of Gary Ridgway. If there was any consolation for Judith, it's that he killed fewer women after meeting her. Author Penny Moorhead interviewed Ridgway, who said his urge to kill reduced after meeting her, and that he genuinely loved her. But if he loved her that much, why would he have put her in the position she is in? now. Between 1985 and 1998, it's believed that Ridgway killed four women, a lot fewer than in the years before he met Judith. Do you think about the women and their families? Oh, yes. My heart goes out to all of the families and the victims that he hurt and
Many people were cynical about Judith's comments, arguing that she either may have shown or should have known. But there are other family members and friends with exactly the same impression. One of Gary's brothers, as well as Gary's co-workers and friends, had the same impression. Speaking about Ridgeway, the Kings County prosecutor concluded he was not a loner. He controlled his anger. He had no significant juvenile criminal history. He was either married or had a steady girlfriend all of his adult life. The prosecution added, those who thought they knew Ridgeway best did not know him at all. Fooled by a fool. It's often a stereotype that serial killers have high IQs and are deeply intelligent. Ridgeway's IQ, meanwhile, was in the low 80s. How could someone whose tests reveal below average intelligence manage to outsmart the police for decades? Investigators found that Ridgeway meticulously planned these killings down to their finer details. When police questioned these murders, he knew everything because he planned almost every single step. When picking up sex workers, he wore gloves. Unlike many serial killers, there were no trophies he kept from his other victims. He did, however, leave pieces of jewelry from his victims in the bathrooms at his work. It thrilled him that he thought there were people out there wearing jewelry from his victims. When one of his arms was badly scratched, he basted it with battery acid to explain the wound. If his clothes got ripped, he clipped the fingernails of his victim before dumping them. Sometimes, he would pass off an injury from his nighttime killings as a work-related injury, and was even brazen enough to claim workers' compensation. At Kenworth Truck Factory, Gary was a model employee and had been given awards for perfect attendance. If the police pulled Ridgeway over, they would find no weapons in his car. In fact, he managed to kill all of these women with his own bare hands. And this is why he he never killed his wives. He even fantasized about killing his son, but never went through with it. If he killed one of his kin, it would make him a prime suspect. Reed Malloy, a forensic psychologist and associate clinical professor of psychiatry at the University of California in San Diego, said, To have strong feelings of pride in one's career as a serial murderer and then not communicate that to anyone for 21 years is a measure of remarkable discipline. Prison life. Time went on, and the prison hours went by slowly. Because of his notoriety, Gary has been isolated from other prisoners. John McCoy, a former reporter for the Seattle Post-Intelligentsia, said, Ridgeway is someone who could be at risk for assault by other prisoners. Keith Farrington, a sociologist at Whitman College, said, It's possible that some of the 49 or so people that he killed have relatives in the penitentiary. Ridgeway's murder was of major interest. As an act of retribution, Ridgeway said that any profits made from books, TV shows, and movies about his crimes should go to the victims' families. On Tuesday, December 21st, 2010, a hiker found a skull, and this was again linked to Ridgeway. He pled guilty to the murder of Rebecca Marrero on February 18th, 2011, adding a 49th life term to his previous 48. As well as DNA, there was another startling discovery made. At the crime scene of some of these murders, there were microscopic paint spheres from a specific brand and composition of paint paint. This paint was not sold to the public, and the only nearby place where you could find this paint was at the Kenworth factory. And that bit of evidence is the most heartbreaking of all. The DNA evidence pinned on Ridgeway was not around in the 1980s when he was at his most prolific, but the forensics which found the paint spheres were. The evidence was right in front of them the entire time. Frank Adamson, now retired King County Sheriff's Commander, who supervised the Green River Task Force in the mid-1980s, said, I'm appalled. I didn't know that was even possible. It would have been nice if we could have saved a life or two, or all of them. In 2013, Ridgeway said that he may have murdered close to 80 women. Court reports reveal that he simply lost count. Why? We now know who the Green River Killer is. We know how he killed and who he did it to. But the most important question of all is why. When speaking to investigators, Ridgeway admitted that there was something inside other people, but missing from him, caring. Ridgeway did not care about these women. He did not see them as people with names, families, and friends. Marsha Chapman, Opal Mills, Cynthia Hines. These were not people to Gary. He just saw them as objects that could satisfy his sick desires. Along the western slopes of the Cascade Range, the Green River runs deep, as does the hatred that Gary Ridgeway Ridgeway had for women. Ridgeway was tested for mental illnesses and issues, but there was no sickness that could explain his sick behavior. Ridgeway was the sickness. He suffered from no mental illness that would absolve him of responsibility for these crimes. In five months of interviews, he displayed no empathy for his victims and expressed no genuine remorse. He killed because he wanted to. He killed because he could. He killed to satisfy his evil and unfathomable desires. To explain this behavior, psychologists have honed in on those early days of his life, where the soiled bedsheets caused so much embarrassment. Reed Malloy, the forensic psychologist, psychologist I mentioned before said, with humiliation would come rage toward the mother. That is very common in serial murderers. Displaced matricide. Unconsciously is killing his mother over and over again. A different path. However, most sexually abused children don't become serial murderers. In fact, Dave Reichert, the very detective hired to investigate Ridgeway, was also a victim of child abuse. It was being a helpless victim of a crime that led him to work in law enforcement. In the decades following the Green River killings, he has since been elected to Congress. In 2014, he signed the Preventing Sex Trafficking and Improving Opportunities for Youth in Foster Care Act, which is designed to help the very type of women who fell prey to the likes of Gary Ridgeway. Speaking to the imprint, Reichert said, My entire 
career focused on trying to help kids, especially during the Green River serial murder case. I worked with young women who, back then, it was called the prostitution trade. Today, it's human trafficking. 95% of the young girls who were working on the streets back then were foster kids and runaways. My job was not only in trying to find a killer of these young girls, but also helping them. In 1982, Gary Ridgway picked up a young girl named Wendy Lee Caulfield, a runaway girl from foster care who had no option but to become a sex worker. Gary Ridgway was the last human face she saw. She was 16 years old at the time, and today, she would be in her late 50s. In a perfect world, there would be no Gary Ridgway. But in a more practical world, we can stop the Gary Ridgways of this world from causing more misery and allow the Wendy Lee Cofields of the world to have better and brighter lives. Thank you so much for watching. Please click on one of the videos you see in front of you now, and I'll see you there.